All right, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. We sure have a great crowd. Um, it's going to be tight in here, so just grab a seat wherever you can. If you can't find one, we will be happy to set up more tables and chairs for you. Um, a few housekeeping items before we begin. Restrooms are going to be right into the hall and take a right. Um, you won't have to walk very far and you'll see them. We do have snacks and drinks set up in the kitchen, so grab yourself something at any point if you need to stretch. Um, lunch is going to be at noon and Carolyn's will be catering that today. Um, and I need to say a few thank yous because this deal wouldn't happen without a few people in this room. Back there behind the sound booth, that's Jan Steen. He is the Reno County Agri or excuse me, Technology Extension Agent. And I need to put a plug in for you, Jan, because if you have any questions about your iPad, your computer, your iPhone, anything technology, Jan is the one to talk to. He works with quite a few people on just how to set them up up and that sort of thing. So if you have app questions or whatever, Jan is a wealth of knowledge. Um, this meeting is going to be recorded today, so if you need to go back and brief it, uh, we're going to post it on our website as well as YouTube. And I also want to say a few thank yous to our, our fellow agents that are in the hall taking registrations. Mark Ploger from Pratt County, Glenn Newdigger from Stafford County, Joni James from McPherson County all came and helped me publicize this event. Uh, so we sure do appreciate that. Um, I'm going to let Dale Ladd come up here and say a few words. This meeting couldn't happen without the funding behind it and People's Bank and Trust is, is a generous sponsor of this meeting. So, Dale, here you go. Thank you, Cody. Um, not going to take very much time here this morning, but I just wanted to say uh, thanks to K-State Research and Extension for allowing People's Bank to help make this happen. Uh, we're always interested in uh, good things that could happen to the people in, in the Reno County area. Uh, I work out of the McPherson branch, uh, farm loans and also farm management. Uh, Ronell Schrog over here is the branch president at Yoder and uh, some of the other people around of course um, Dick Koloff couldn't be here today he's um, out doing something. John Knipp uh, is in Texas uh, managing some farms and um, Kim um, Schroeder, Kim Owens up in Nickerson. Uh, I work up there on Thursdays. Um, you can talk to her anytime you want to. One of the things I wanted to mention, uh, People's Bank and Trust, uh, there is the trust side of the bank. We have a full service staff. Um, we'd be glad to talk to you about anything relative to trust services, estate planning, uh, IRAs, financial management, uh, I spend about half my time in agricultural asset management or farm management uh, along with John Knipp and uh, Colleen Ward there at Hutchison. So if you have any questions about trusts or anything to do with the trust, uh, feel free to talk to John Knipp, Colleen Ward, uh, the staff up at McPherson's, Roger Swanson, Kathy Enns, and Dee Feeder. Uh, lots of experience. Um, I can say this, I guess, they're just real nice people and they're easy to talk to, um, free, that's a pretty big word nowadays, there, there's no charge if you want to talk, so feel free to visit and uh, again, uh, thanks Cody for letting us be a part of this. Well, we're going to get started here. Um, Roger McAllen, all the way from Iowa State University. Uh, we sure do appreciate you coming down to sp uh, speak at a K-State event. Roger uh, used to be faculty at K-State, and, and I probably don't need to say much. You're going to uh, understand here in a couple hours why you're here today. So, Roger, I'll let you take it over. Thank you. Thanks, Cody, and uh, the rest of the participating counties and People's Bank. We really appreciate it. Okay. It's good to see a good turnout today, and uh, I'm glad to be where it's warm. It has been so cold. Uh, we're back below zero for a high today of two below. Um, I have a son that's coming home from Los Angeles on Saturday, and he's been out in Los Angeles training for his new job for a month, and he called us last night and said, is this supposed to be 11 below with six inches of snow when I get home Saturday? Yeah. 
it is. Um, but uh, it, uh, this is really nice and a great turnout. I think we'll hopefully have uh, a lot of good information for you today on farm business planning, succession planning, kind of the new changes in the law, some new taxes that you have to worry about as landowners, and uh, particularly one that's, uh, that's going to hit a lot of you, and that's a passive tax that came in under Obamacare and started in 2013 and how that impacts planning. Uh, let me give you contact information first. Uh, each of you sh should have picked up a couple of sheets uh, of additional handouts, and I'll refer to those as we go throughout the day. And uh, our website address is on there. And, uh, <clears throat> but here is the, the mailing address, my phone number, my email address, my staff attorney's phone number, and her email address, Christine. Uh, she'd be glad to visit with you if you have questions and you can't get a hold of me. And then our fax number and then again the website address. And, and uh, throughout the day I'll, I'll get into that website and I'll show you some of the things that are there. Uh, we do put out a monthly newsletter. We do, we are involved in social media. Uh, for those that, sub that uh, sign up for that you can get instant updates on things that happen. Uh, we will tweet a photo of this uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, so some of you may show up on a, on a tweeted photo that comes out after this meeting is done. But uh, that's how you can get a hold of us. Uh, if you need more of that information, again, the website address is on each of the handouts uh, near the top between the, the uh, two sets of lines. And all of our contact information uh, is on the website. Okay? And... Uh, Again, I do appreciate the chance to, to be here today. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, kind of get into uh, some of the issues and, and start out generally speaking. Uh, what are some of the objectives of estate planning, a secession planning, business planning? Uh, and many times these objectives overlap and they're all part of the, of the overall plan that you're trying to put together. And for, for farmers and ranchers, many times you're not dealing just with an estate plan, but you're dealing with a family business. So you've got business planning issues and how you move the interests in that family business down to the next generation, where you have the situation where you have younger uh, generations people in the family that are interested uh, and willing to uh, willing and interested in continuing the business in into subsequent generations so um, that's an issue not every farm family is like that there are some that don't have kids that uh, will be taking over the operation after the parents generation is gone uh, there may be uh, in-laws that are interested in it there may be in-laws that are working with the uh, current generation right now that presents some issues we're going to try to get through some of those today too, but every situation is unique. But uh, objectives of succession planning, business planning, estate planning, that's what has to drive the process. And so those have to be articulated clearly. One of the, one of the most difficult things um, to, to uh, get across to people and one of the most difficult things that people have to deal with uh, is just getting started with the process, you know, trying to get off of, of ground zero and uh, figure out what it is your objectives are. What are your goals? What are your objectives? What do you want this business, this farming operation, this ranching operation to look like after you and your spouse are gone? Who's going who's gonna to run the business? Who's going to control it? Uh, what are our tax issues? What are our non-tax issues? How are we going to solve those issues? What type of entity uh, structure uh, should we have? Should we have more than one entity? Should we have multiple entities? Uh, what about leasing arrangements? Uh, who's going to be in control? We'll talk about buy sell agreements later on and I'm going to highlight an Iowa case for you that should be you know, pretty troubling uh, that points out the need to have a, a well-drafted buy-sell agreement to transition the business from generation to generation. What are some of the pitfalls? Uh, what are the things that can sink the entire plan? Uh, there are disasters. I could, we could spend the rest of the day just talking about cases uh, that are disaster situations where everything's just blown up uh, on the family. Uh, and there are, there are some landmines that are out there. How how can we identify those landmines and perhaps plan around them? There's not a one-size-fits-all solution to all of this. There's just a lot of things to think about. We'll try and highlight some of those things today. And one of the additional documents, I've titled that Common Estate Planning Mistakes. And I've just kind of kept uh, a catalog of these things as the years go by and the, the people that I meet and the situations that I run across. Uh, uh, either personally or by reading cases or anecdotally and just kind of we're going to go through that and these are some of the uh, these are some of the landmines to avoid and we'll get into that later in the day but um, 
hopefully that's one that you could, after the discussion of that, you can really think about. Uh, maybe that'll provide you some help in your own family situations. But one of the toughest things is to figure out what your objectives are and then articulate those to the people that are trying to help you. Uh, the estate planning lawyers, the, your, your tax counsel, life insurance agents, financial planners, um, um, bankers, farm managers. What are your goals? What are your objectives? What do you want to do? To the extent that you can articulate what those objectives are, there's a greater chance that your goals and objectives can be satisfied. Okay, so it's very important to kind of think through the process, figure out it is what you want to accomplish with the entire process, and then convey that to the professionals that are trying to help you. Okay, there's nothing more frustrating from a professional standpoint to not really get a grasp on wh what you're supposed to be doing. What is the end goal with respect to this? I've got to be able to see how this fits together. Now, you don't need to understand all the details. I do, but I've got to know what your general goals and objectives are, what your family structure is, what are your plans with respect to buying land, uh, what's your plans with respect to the type of operation that you're running, and again, like I said earlier, who's going to take this over after you and your spouse? are gone. So some of the common objectives that we see is people will say, well, I want to bring in the next generation into the business. So how do we successfully do that? How do we successfully transition the operation from the current operators to those that are going to be the operators after the current generation is gone? if the goal is to continue the business as a viable economic unit. Uh, how do we provide a vocation for the next generation? How do we establish a base for a financially successful business into the future? There's a whole lot of considerations that come into that. So you know, we want to transition the business, but we want it to be a viable operation in the hands of the successors. I just spent uh, part of Tuesday afternoon, I had spoken in northeastern Iowa uh, up through uh, noon and then the luncheon on Tuesday and then stopped in Cedar Rapids. Uh, to visit with a, for an hour and a half with a bankruptcy lawyer, the, probably the most prominent bankruptcy lawyer in Iowa. He's also on, on our board, our center's board, and he was untangling a Chapter 12, Chapter 7 bankruptcy for a dairy farm operation that didn't do good secession planning, and the business transitioned into the hands of operators that didn't know how to run a dairy and made some really bad decisions, and now they find themselves in bankruptcy. Had they done the appropriate planning, this, what we're seeing and what we, he was unfolding to me, um, appeared to me that this could have been perfectly avoidable. And so that's the kind of things we're trying to avoid, and I, I think that maybe that's one of the reasons that you're here today. Providing a plan for the older generation, that's an exit plan, so we want to transition the next generation in, but that also involves transitioning the current generation out in a manner that is uh, viable for them. So retirement planning becomes very important. Uh, you don't want to outlive your income stream. Okay? And what are the perils of outliving one's income stream? You don't want to do what an individual did um, not too long ago, uh, paid seven figures for a Manhattan, New York uh, apartment complex, and he knew he was buying a remainder interest after the life estate holder who was a widow, uh, after her husband had passed away, she got a life estate interest in this multi-million dollar apartment complex off of Park Avenue in New York City. So he buys the, the remainder interest. He's in his, he's um, uh, at the time about 60, and the life estate holder was uh, early 80s because her spouse had just recently died. And she holds it, so she's got the she's got the possession of it. She's got the income from it for her life. She lived to be 106. He died before she did. He paid seven figures for this remainder interest. Never got anything. Oops. So that's one of the considerations that's out there. That's bad secession planning in that instance. Um, but you don't want to outlive, she didn't outlive her income stream. She had a substantial income stream, but she outlived him, okay, as the remainder holder. Uh, one of the other things that you don't want to do, since we're uh, mentioning New York uh, people, this is a Kansas case, and it uh, came down a little bit over a year ago in federal district court out of Wichita. 
but there was a big uh, New York investment firm that bought a big ranch of about 7,000 acres out in southwest Kansas. And uh, the auction, they bought it at public auction, and the auctioneer announced at the sale that the buyer is uh, getting all the mineral interests that the seller owns. You need to check on that. Um, you know, I could sell you all the real estate that I own in Alaska. I could quick claim deed it to you. You'd have a nice deed. You wouldn't own anything, because I don't own anything. Uh, what happened was the ranch out in southwest Kansas, it was a family operation and a real good operation of crops and oil and gas interests. And uh, I know the attorney that's worked with this family for years and it, he's done a bang up job on the estate plan, the business plan. And um, there had been a, a, a severance of the surface estate from the subsurface estate years ago. And one branch of the family owned the subsurface estate, owned the oil and gas interest and the other branch of the family owned the surface estate. And it was that branch of the family that sold uh, for about $9 million this ranch to the New York investment firm. Okay. A couple years later, uh, they're reading in the newspaper, these New York investors, uh, that uh, there was an underground shale deposit discovered out in southwestern Kansas. It just happened to be under the land that they bought. What happened uh, prior to that discovery was that some Texas oil companies had sent their wildcatters up to southwestern Kansas to go through the land records and look, do uh, uh, mineral deeds to figure out who owns the minerals and they determined that, it, well, okay, it's this branch of the family that owns the minerals and so they started entering into oil and gas leases with them. New York investment firm that owns the surface estate, thinking they own everything, uh, contact sees this in the newspaper and says, oh, now, you know, we paid eight, nine million for this. We're, this is gravy. So they contacted some oil company and said, wouldn't you like to enter into leases with us for our oil and gas rights? Well, you don't own any oil and gas rights. What do you mean? We got whatever the seller had. That's right. They didn't have anything. You get a big lawsuit over this, and, and uh, what an absolute mess. Uh, that's poor planning, okay? Tax minimization is another one, and providing an estate plan that's fair to on-farm and off-farm heirs. That's a big issue in successful estate planning and business planning and succession planning. How many of you in here have uh, kids, grandkids, so forth, what will become heirs at some point in time, that have no interest in continuing uh, to be an operator on the farming or ranching operation, but at the same time, you also have other potential heirs that are interested. That's a unique problem, because probably what you also want to do with respect to all these heirs, if they're your kids, well, I want to be fair. I, or I want to treat them equal. Equal's not the same thing as fair. And we might get into that a little bit more, but that requires a little bit more effort in the estate planning aspect of things, the business planning aspect of things. How do we separate out these interests, but yet treat the kids fairly or in a manner that they think is fair? At least that they perceive is fair and they won't cause problems later on. So how do we separate out those interests but yet get them the interests that they want and at the same time make sure the business continues in the hands of those heirs that are the ones that are interested and capable of continuing the business. That's a key point of transition planning. Okay, so those are the major objectives. You might have more objectives. Those are the common ones that we typically see and typically have to deal with. Uh, but those are, those are some of the big ones. And this, uh, if we just diagrammatically show this, um, estate planning, succession planning, business planning, they kind of overlap. A lot of the areas overlap. We don't do, we don't sit down with clients, for example, and just, okay, we're gonna do estate planning. And then over here we do business planning. And over here we do succession planning. No, there are, there are unique areas with each one, but there are also lots of areas of overlap. So it's kind of a, 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 a planning and a, an entire plan that's put together that combines the concepts. So a lot of things weave together. It is difficult. This is a process that takes time. This is not something that you sit down in one shot, uh, you've got all the documents drafted and you're done. No, it takes months. It takes months. 
longest I've ever worked on one in one particular situation was two and a half years to put it all together. Incredibly complex. Is it costly? Yeah. Uh, I also sh sat down with an individual in Missouri about three years ago, went down to his office and uh, had gotten, he had come up to our office and I'd visited with him and I'd gotten together enough information that I could put together a proposed plan as to what I thought he needed to do. It went down to his office in Missouri. And this guy's a, a very, uh, very well-to-do individual. He's worth, a, he was worth at that time about 26 million. Uh, and his wife have a daughter. She was at the University of Missouri at the time. And he's got a big farming operation in Missouri, and he's also got, uh, he's a big game hunter, and he goes all over the world, and he hunts big game, and he took me out to his house, and he showed me his game room, which is about half the size of this gym, as you can imagine, and it's just, he, he's been on safaris, and up in the Yukon, and all over the place. Um, this incredible house, and I don't know what it was worth, it had to be several million dollars, and when push came to shove, this is a guy that doesn't have a will, mind you. He doesn't even have a basic will, and he's worth it at that time at least 26 million. Okay, no will. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. That is horrible. Uh, but um, he didn't even have basic planning. Why? He said, "Well, I don't like lawyers." And, well, great. I mean, that's nice to know when I'm sitting here with you, and they're all there's your gun cabinets and <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And he said, well, what's all this going to cost? And I said, well, I would project if you have someone do this, I wasn't going to do it for him. I'm not licensed in Missouri. Uh, but I would suggest um, this is going to be six figures, and it's probably going to be between 100 and 200,000 to get it done. But when you get all of this done, given where you're at right now, this will save you over $12 million in tax. He wouldn't do it. He walked away. What I also haven't told you is, at that time I was talking to him, he had already been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Now, you know, you've heard the saying, you can lead a horse to drink, but you can't make him. I can't tell you how frustrating that was. I, I guess if he wants to send 12 and a half million extra dollars to Washington, D.C., they, in all their wisdom, they know what to do with it, I'm sure. But he walked away from the table because he didn't want to spend between one and two hundred thousand dollars to save twelve and a half million in tax and keep his business together. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but there are a lot of people out there like that. Mm. Okay, and, and he, he would be one of those that wouldn't be at a meeting like this today. He wouldn't come to a meeting like this. No, he doesn't have time. Yeah, he's too busy to do that. Um, yeah, okay. Let's talk uh, briefly uh, about some of these transfer tax changes, changes with respect to estate and gift that came in in January of 2013 under the American Taxpayer Relief Act. That's what ATRA stands for, ATRA. I always get a kick out of these um, acronyms that Congress comes up with and the names of tax bills that they give them. The American Taxpayer Relief Act as if increasing our taxes is supposed to relieve us. Well, it does relieve us of money, yes. I guess if that's what they mean by relief, um, that's probably a good way to call this because there are significant tax increases in this uh, bill. But nevertheless, it's called the American Taxpayer Relief Act. And I'm just focusing on the estate planning aspects of this legislation, not the income tax side of things. I think there are four key characteristics with respect to what Congress did in the 2013 law. And again, all of this information, you can read more detailed articles on our website. If I'm going too fast for you to take notes, it's all there. Uh, in fact, the one article is the cover sheet that shows you where you can get to the PDF of the full document. Uh, so all this stuff is on our website uh, in much more detail. But let me just kind of thumbnail sketch what I think are the key points with respect to just the estate gift tax system uh, with respect to the changes that Congress gave us under the 2013 legislation. Now one of the frustrating things, just as an aside, is uh, f uh, initially I'll talk from the estate planning standpoint, is Congress in the last few years, uh, the last 10 years in particular, has gotten really bad about getting tax legislation to us late. 
And a lot of these provisions came in on a retroactive basis, which makes income tax planning, um, any type of long-term planning a year or two years in advance, we just can't do it anymore because we don't know what the law is going to be. That was a problem that we had with respect to the um, estate tax provisions too. Because uh, if you remember, two out of the last three years, we got to the end of the year not knowing what the estate tax exemption for federal estate tax purposes was going to be for the next year. Remember that? That is, you know, you know, should I make gifts? What do I do with my spectrum with respect to my estate plan, my business plan? I don't know because we don't know, we didn't know what the rules were going to be out into the future. That's incredibly frustrating. We can guess, we can speculate, but technically we don't have a good idea until Congress tells us what the rules are going to be. And then what they did was uh, after the fact, after the year it expired, came in with this law and reinstated uh, an exemption at $5 million, took it back retroactive, uh, gave you an option for one year to opt out of it in 2010. It's just maddening what they've been doing. With ATRA, at least we've got permanence. We've got permanence. That's my first point here. We know what the rules are going to be. Now, when I say permanent, in congressional lingo, that means until the next time they change the law. But at least we know what the rules are until they change the rules. What we haven't known before is what the rules are going to be because they were going to expire. So we've gotten, we've gotten permanence. We've got a $5 million exemption from estate tax, as you'll see in a moment, indexed for inflation. And that's my next point. We've got indexing. So the exemption was $5 million, then last year it was $5.25 million for deaths. This year it's $5.34 million. So we've got some permanence and we've got indexing, and that's per decedent. So for a married couple, that's $10.68 million, um, no estate tax. So if you're under that, you don't have any federal estate tax. Kansas has cleaned up their rules too. We don't have a problem at the state level, but if you own property in other states, there may be an issue. You got property in Nebraska, there's a state inheritance tax. Iowa's got a state inheritance tax. More and more states are moving away from that. Don't, um, don't, probably a good plan would be not to move from Kansas to Minnesota. Minnesota has a horrible uh, system of taxation at death. They, they have a gift tax, they have an estate tax, uh, it's just a mess. So don't go to, plus it's, cold, it's even colder there than it is in Iowa, it's just awful. Um, I had a guy call me not too long ago, he lived in Texas and then he, he worked for the University of Texas and he retired to Minnesota. And I was just kind of quiet on the phone for a moment. I said, you get it backwards, pal. Uh, why did you go from Texas to Minnesota? And he said, well, after this winter, I, yeah, you're right. Uh, but nevertheless, people do strange things. But don't die there. Uh, that's not a good place to die. Unification. The estate gift tax systems are unified. So that unified credit, that $5.34 million exclusion that's offset by a credit that's worth a little bit more than $2 million, uh, that's what offsets the $5.34 million. That applies for gift tax too. Okay. You still have the, uh, you're probably familiar with, the ability to make present interest annual exclusion gifts of $14,000 per year per donee. That's not gift taxable, and that doesn't work against your credit. But once you get beyond that, then you've got the $5.34 million to offset potential taxable gifts. And to the extent you don't offset taxable gifts with that during life, that's still there to offset taxable estate at death. Okay, so it's unified. You can play it uh, with both estate tax as well as gift tax. The fourth aspect coming out of ATRA is portability of the estate tax exclusion at the death of the first spouse. This one's key. We've not had this before, except until recent years, and now it's permanent. This is a biggie. Because what this means is that for every estate where the spousal worth is less than 10.68 million, there should never be any estate tax. And you, re, technically, you don't have to have uh, marital deduction wills drafted to accomplish that. 
And what I mean by that is you may be familiar with a technique that uh, if you have a relatively larger estate, what, what the plan typically has been is at the death of the first spouse, or whoever dies first doesn't matter because we put the same provisions in the husband's will as, as, as in the wife's will because we don't know who's going to die first. So we want to go this way, the same way, this way, depending on who dies first. So we have the same provisions. And what that would commonly mean is that we're going to carve up, we're going to own all the property as tenants in common, we're going to get rid of joint tenancy form of ownership so that we can control passage of that under the terms of the will. And what we do, let's say, in the husband's estate is we would say at time of death we're going to maximize uh, stuff enough property in what's known as a credit shelter trust up to the ex exemption level with the balance going life estate to the, or that goes life estate to the spouse and then the balance goes outright to the spouse. So we've got a credit shelter, which is a life estate remainder portion of the, to the surviving spouse, probably a remainder to the kids, but the spouse has the property for life. The balance going outright to the spouse, that's marital deduction. So we've wiped out tax in the first estate, and then we minimize it substantially in, in the surviving spouse's estate because the life estate property is not taxed in the survivor's estate. Okay, we don't have to do that anymore. Why? This exclusion at the death of the first spouse is portable. Now, what I mean by that is when the first, this is known, the, the technical term for this is the deceased spouse unused exclusion amount, or the DSUEA, the DSUE. And that's why I talk about it on the website in the more technical pieces that I have there. But this is a big one. Because this means you don't have to have marital deduction wills prepared anymore. You could just have a simple, uh, a very simple will uh, and make the election uh, with respect to portability. How this works is, is this, and there has to be an election that's made. Let's say that you've got a, a $2 million estate. Dad dies. Uh, doesn't have a marital deduction will, property goes to mom. Do you have to file an estate tax return in dad's estate? No, it's below the 5.34 million. But we want to file an estate tax return for purposes of electing portability because that's how you do it. It has to be on a timely filed 706. It's the form 706 is the IRS's estate tax return form. And what you say on there is, uh, I didn't use up very much of the spouse's exclusion. Let's say there was only two million taxed in that first spouse's estate, you got an exclusion of 5.34, so you used part of your credit to offset exclusion up to two million in that estate, but you left a bunch of it on the table. See what I mean? Dad had a 5.34, mom's got a 5.34, dad only used two. So it's the deceased spouse's unused exclusion amount. I've got 3.34 million. You file a 706 in dad's estate, that 3.34 million carries over to mom, so she's got her 5.34 million plus the 3.34 million, and we didn't have to do any technical estate planning to get it over there, which is what a marital deduction will would have done. We don't have to do that. Congress bailed, bailed you out on this one. It goes automatically if you file the 706 in the first spouse's estate. Now you say, wow, 10.68 million. I, we don't have to worry about this. We don't need to make this election in the first spouse's estate. I think if you've just got $50,000 total, you need to make the election in the first spouse's estate. Why? Well, you don't know what the surviving spouse is going to come into. There may be oil that's discovered under the land that they're sitting on. Now, all of a sudden, they're sitting there with nine, ten million dollars, and you didn't carry over the unused exclusion, and now you got a bunch of tax when the surviving spouse dies. So, general rule of thumb always, always, always file a 706 in the first spouse's estate to, if for nothing else, even if there's no tax that's due because it's a small estate, to make that portability election. It has to be done, it is by election, it's not automatic. Okay? IRS just recently gave all small estates a free pass uh, because uh, there were a lot of people that weren't heeding this advice and were not making the election of the first spouse's estate. IRS just said uh, recently, okay, uh, you've got a certain amount of time here to correct this. You can go ahead and we'll count it as good. Just go ahead and file the 706. Even though it's late, we'll count it. And they just announced that a couple of weeks ago. We tweeted that out on the website. I thought they were probably going to do that, but until they did, we couldn't say for sure. But that, I'll come back to this a little bit later. But those are the four key aspects of the 
2013 tax legislation with respect to estate planning. Now that, that's not talking about the income tax side of things. That's still a mess. Uh, the big issues that we get with respect to that, and, and I can't tell you, I would answer, I've, I've got a wireless device that allows me to work while I'm in the car and my, my wife drives and my granddaughter is sitting next to me. Um, I know You can ask me lots of stuff about Elmo now. I know a lot about Elmo that I never knew before uh, and all these characters on Sesame Street and so forth. Um, I know more than I ever want to know about that, but uh, I was answering one question and by the time I get one answered I'd have three more uh, yesterday. It was an absolute nightmare. Well, why? What are we coming up against? Filing deadline for farmers is Monday. It normally would be March 1st, but that's a Saturday. And so I've got all these CPAs that are asking questions at the last minute, trying to handle these returns that are in front of them. Uh, and, and one of the big issues that's out there on the income tax side of things, the depreciation provisions. What's going on with the expense method depreciation and bonus depreciation? Now, this, in, this is an income tax issue, but depreciation is such a big issue for farmers and ranchers, it can impact on the estate planning and business planning side of things. And I had one of these questions come up that did get tied into kind of business plan and estate planning yesterday. Uh, what Congress has done is created, again, a whole great deal of uncertainty with respect to these depreciation provisions. Section 179, or expense method depreciation, had been maxed at five $500,000 on your qualified property through last year. For 2014, and the returns are getting filed right now, that's the last year that you can expense up to $500,000, say on a tractor or a combine or other type of machinery or equipment or a single purpose ag structure in an ag business. For 2014, if Congress doesn't change the rules, it's $25,000. You go from a half million to 25. Now tell me that doesn't impact your business planning decisions uh, long term, your asset purchases. Yes. Uh, do I think they will allow that to stand actually when we get around this time next year to preparing returns? Is it going to actually be 25000 I don't think so. I, I just can't see that. Uh, I can't see them allowing that collapse. Okay, so when will we get the legislation that bumps it back up and to what level? I don't know. I don't think they're going to do it prior to the fall election. Oh, great. You mean I've got the end of the year, I'm going to have to make these decisions? Well, perhaps, yeah. Look what they did last time. If you remember what they did last time on this, they waited until after the tax year had closed and then got into January and increased it back up to 500000 for a year that's already gone. A lot of fat good that is. Well, yeah, but it's a windfall if you had purchased expensive assets in those years thinking you only had $25,000 and now they jacked it back up. Well, you're, <laughs> you're good. You're golden. But you can't plan that kind of stuff. And see, we want to plan big ticket asset purchases around our estate planning and business planning decisions. And this is some of the frustration that we have trying to deal with this kind of stuff. That's just one of the depreciation provisions. The other one's bonus depreciation, first year bonus depreciation. That was 50% uh, off the top allowance after you take your 179 amount. So let's say you bought a, a big ticket item of qualified asset, uh, $700,000. You took your 500,000 off, you got 200,000 left, take another 100,000 off under your 50% bonus, and then depreciate out the, the 100,000 that's remaining under regular makers. Okay, bonus depreciation is gone. It's eliminated starting in 2014. So for 2014, if Congress does nothing, we have two huge changes with respect to depreciation. Expense method depreciation has collapsed down to 25,000. Bonus is gone. That does impact planning. Now, do I think that bonus will be gone by the time we prepare next, this year's returns that are filed next year? No. Do I have any sense of idea when um, They'll come back in? No. That, it's maddening. That stuff, kind of stuff is maddening. And you have, you got boots on the ground trying to deal with this stuff, and you can't make rational decisions for your business. I know that's frustrating. Okay? There was a tax bill that was proposed yesterday by Representative Camp, 
uh, it's the GOP's tax bill. And one of the tax services that I use this morning, I read the commentary every morning. I've never seen this used this way before, but you can tell the tax services are frustrated with what Congress does. And it's got all the depreciation changes in it. It's got a ramp up in 179. It restores the bonus depreciation, all this other stuff. A lot of good stuff in there. Uh, it allows cash method accounting for all businesses that have gross receipts under $10 million. And so it retains that for farming operations. And the, uh, the tax service that I was reading this morning classified this as a bill that is stillborn. Not going to go anywhere. I've never seen a tax service refer to proposed legislation like that. But you can tell they're so frustrated, this isn't going to happen. This is going to go nowhere. So they referred to it as stillborn. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the new repair regs uh, that, that, that were finalized and started this year, I've got a detailed piece on the website about those. Uh, fortunately, in the final regs, we got some relief for farming operations. I think farmers are going to be able to, to uh, uh, not be bothered as much by these repair regs as they would have been in the proposed regs. I did a webinar on that in January. I don't know if it's still available uh, through the Iowa Bar Association, but our stuff on the website is there for the repair regs. But that's a big issue too. Okay. So there are a lot of income tax issues that are out there that do impact what we try to do from an estate planning, business planning, succession planning standpoint. And that area is so up in the air. Uh, we just can't get any permanence out of Congress on so many key provisions. But back to the transfer tax provisions, what the bill did was take the top estate and gift tax rate and move it up to 40%. It had been 35%. Now it's 40%. The lifetime exemption stays at 5 million. It's inflation indexed. As I said, that's 5.34 million for deaths this year. Okay, it's also 5.34 million for gifts. Yeah, that's why I say it remains coupled. Portability is retained, so the surviving spouse, as I said, can inherit the deceased spouse's unused exemption. But again, you have to file a 706 in the first spouse's estate and elect portability. And I would just um, uh, write this as a note down on a piece of paper that you've got. Routinely, always make the election in the first spouse's estate regardless of size. Doesn't matter what the value of the estate is. You want to carry over that unused exemption to the surviving spouse. You just want it to be there, period. I can't imagine a situation where you wouldn't do that. Could be simply because you don't know what's going to happen with respect to the surviving spouse. They may actually need it, they may not, but if it's not there, then there's going to be potential tax if they're over uh, the 5.34. You, you want to just carry it over to add it on to what the surviving spouse has. But that rate change is pretty easy to deal with. All we do is go from 35 to 40 percent on the top end. There's no carryover effect from year to year or from gifts to estates. Now on this carryover effect, let me jump back real quick to, bon uh, to uh, expense method depreciation. One of the questions I got yesterday was a, un a unique question. The practitioner is trying to deal with a big amount of Section 179 depreciation that they could claim for their farm client in 2013. And there, there's a self-employment tax connection to this, and, and it does impact your other deductions and so forth that you can claim for personal exemption. And they were wondering if they left a bunch of that on the table because, because you're limited to the amount of business income that you have. So if you want to take 500,000 of expense method depreciation, you've got to have 500,000 of income from farming to do that, for example. Okay, so you're limited by your income. And they said, okay, I've got about a little over $100,000 of, of uh, income to play with here. Uh, if, I only, if I max out my expense method to, to match that income level and I've got to carry over into 2014 and Congress does not increase the current $25,000 amount, C can I carry that over and add it on to the $25,000? The answer is no. I went back and read the statute and read uh, the regs on that. My interpretation is you're stuck. Without congressional legislation, these people that are limited by income on the 179 amount, there's going to be a bunch of farmers in that potentially. And you've got a, a, on a big amount that you're carrying over, so you're trying to carry over two or 300,000. You're stuck at 25 next year. They, there's no allowance for adding that on as a carryover. That's nasty. 
and I think that's right. Um, I ran that past a couple of others that we consult with, and that's the interpretation they're coming up with too. Uh, we really need some guidance from the IRS on that. I'd like to see what they specifically have to say on that. But I think you're stuck. Here, there's no carryover effect from year to year from gifts to estates. That's not a problem with respect to the estate tax provision. So you don't need to revise familiar estate planning techniques. Now, what I'm saying there is that the act itself does not give you a reason, absent other considerations, to go in and tear out your existing estate plan and, and do over. No. You may have reasons to do that. One would be, well, I haven't revisited it for the last 15 years. Yeah, you probably want to do that. There may be other reasons to go in and revise your estate plan, but just simply because the act raised the top rate from 35 to 40% is not a reason. So there's no reason to alter the existing plan, but revisit it where there have been changes in your finances or in your personal life. Okay? Things you know, happen and that might affect an estate plan or a business plan and you might want to go in and revisit things. At least uh, the suggestion is routinely every couple of years, Look at your estate plan, pull it out, evaluate it, um, see if it still matches your goals and objectives. There, are, there have been significant changes in tax law uh, and in the rules that apply to estate and business plans where when that happens, you want to look at it and make sure that it still comports with what you want to accomplish. Okay. All right. The 40% rate is not a flat rate. So just, look, again, we're still building on some concepts here. Uh, make sure you're clear with respect to that. The estate and gift tax rate is, the top rate is 40. It's not 40 from the first taxable dollar. After you get a million dollars taxable, that's when you hit 40. That's when you get to the 40% rate. There are brackets that are set forth in the code, basically starting at 18% on the first dollar taxable, moving your way up, and you get to 40. So as you run up through that first million dollars of taxable estate beyond your exemption level, then what you've got is um, the run up through the brackets for the first million is 54,200. So any tax payable would be 54,200 less than if the tax were a flat 40% from the first dollar. That's what I'm saying. If the first dollar taxable above your exemption is taxed at 40%, as we get through the first million, where the code says we hit it at 40% once you get to the first million taxable, you would have paid 54,200 more. This is the benefit of the bracket run up. That's all I'm trying to show you here. So just remember that 40% is the top rate. And you hit that once you have a million dollars of taxable estate. That's, and of course, what I mean by taxable estate is once you've burned up your exemption. So basically, if you've got a full exemption left of 5.34 million, you don't hit 40% until you get to 6.34 million. It's a sliding scale starting at 18 on that first million dollars of taxable estate. Okay. So the unified credit, which is slightly over 2 million, it's about 2.1 million, offsets a taxable estate or gift of 5.34 million. Now, from a practitioner's standpoint, what we worry about is the level of the credit. What you think about is the exemption, and that's fine. Uh, but we've got a credit out there that we're actually going to put on the return that will offset 5.34 million of taxable estate. Okay. Portability, again, was made permanent. You still have to file the 706 in the first spouse's estate to make the election. Now, that 706 is due nine months after the date of the decedent's death. You can file an extension and get it out to 15 months, nine months, okay? There was some goofy stuff that was going on in 2010, if you remember. The estate tax was made optional that year, which was really weird. Uh, you could elect out of it if you wanted to. This was when Congress couldn't make up their mind, and so they came back in late and said, well, this is the one year where it actually expired. 
Um, if you remember that, it's just kind of a goofy thing. Uh, some people did time their deaths in 2010. George Steinbrenner picked a, picked a fine time to die. Um, no estate tax, okay? There are issues with respect to basis, of course, income tax basis, and you might actually want to, to plug the property into an estate so, uh, so as to get an increased basis in the hands of the heirs, particularly for smaller sized estates. I had a call come in earlier this week, um, actually it was late last week, this one was actually from the IRS because they didn't know the rule. Uh, I get those calls. IRS will call, and what's the rule on this? Oh boy, you people don't even know the rules. Um, so what happened was the practitioner figured out what income tax basis was. Now they want to go ahead and file an estate tax return for a 2010 death where they elected out. Now IRS had given people an option to do this once you could, you know, if you needed some time to figure out what your income tax basis was in your land or in your equipment, your machinery, and you had opted out of the estate tax and now it looks like, well, we should have opted in. Can they opt in? The IRS was asking me that and I said, no, you guys said in 2012 that you had until the middle of July of 2012 to do this. So that time frame has expired. And so it, it's always bizarre to me when I have to respond to IRS, sending them their own notice that they had issued two years earlier as the guidance. And then you just, you know, you just kind of hang up the phone and shake your head and say, we're in a mess of a, as a country. Uh, this is crazy. But um, <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, that was that weird year. But keep in mind on this portability, again, let me just emphasize, in every first spouse's estate, file that 706 to make the election to carry over the unused exclusion so that the surviving spouse has it. Period. Now it gets, we could come up with a lot more technical discussion on that. What if this, you know, the surviving spouse remarries uh, and outlives that spouse? Um, this only applies to the decedent's last surviving spouse. Now think, think that one through. Congre that's the way Congress wrote it. The deceased spouse unused exclusion amount applies to the decedent's last surviving spouse. So you got mom and dad, dad dies, mom survives, and let's say dad's estate was uh, uh, four million, so the carryover of the exclusion is 1.34. We make the election in dad's estate, we carry over 1.34 million to mom. She's got her own 5.34 plus 1.34, remarries, and remarries somebody with an estate of one million and outlives him. He left 4.34 on the mil uh, 4.34 million on the table. File a 706, carry that over to mom. Then mom dies. Oh, what has she got? She's got her own 5.34, but then does she have the 1.34 from the first spouse or the four plus million from the second spouse? It's the second spouse because that's the last surviving spouse of the decedent. Now think of the arbitrage you can play with this game. You can marry up the exclusion ladder <laughs> if you play your cards right. Okay, what you're looking for on a surviving spouse is somebody that's relatively poorer than your first spouse and sick. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We thought at the see at the center we don't receive any state or federal funds. It's all from what we raise. Uh, uh, where I go out and speak and do seminars uh, across the country and things that we write. Uh, and we th I proposed to my staff uh, some time ago, a little over a year ago, when I was pounding through some of this, getting ready for a presentation, and figured out how this works. I said, hey, we, this is another fundraising event for us. We could start the uh, Center for Ag Law and Taxation called Matchmaking Service, <laughs> where we will match widows and widowers uh, with someone that allows them to move up the exclusion ladder for a $50,000 contribution. We thought that, that's a good idea. And I said, now we need a catchy name as to what we call this matchmaking service. You know, you see these on, on TV, they have various matchmaking services. And um, uh, my staff was submitting me names. I think I still came up with the, the best one, the Black Widow matchmaking service. <laughs> Well, they they kind of killed that idea. And I said, nah, the university's probably not going to like that either if we do this kind of stuff. But anyway, you get the point. Um, with respect to the carry, it's the, it applies to the last surviving spouse. So that gets into the remarriage issue, death and remarriage. Okay. 
And I've, I've mentioned this before, this bypass marital deduction trust approach, you don't really need to use it anymore, but if you've got that in your estate plan, keep it. There's still good reasons to use bypass trust. Uh, you, asset protection from creditors is a real good reason to have that. Although we're starting to see cases, and I just had a, a bankruptcy lawyer send me one of these cases from Massachusetts uh, yesterday. Earlier this week, we had a case. The courts are really getting after these spendthrift trusts, these asset protection trusts. So uh, there may be some limitations on it. What if the surviving spouse remarries? You can use the bypass trust approach to make sure that the property ultimately stays in the hands of the kids of the first marriage. And that's, I'm not going to get into that today, but that's called the Q-tip trust, the Qualified Terminable Interest Trust. And so this technique, this bypass trust approach gets us there. Assets could go down in value, and you've got some protection against that in the bypass trust. Your plan might already have it, so keep it. And there are some administrative issues that you avoid uh, by using the bypass credit shelter trust approach. So if you had a plan drafted you know, five, ten years ago, and it has that approach in it, I'm not saying tear it out. Now, that's okay. You you don't have to have it now because of portability, but if you've got it, keep it. And I would say with some people, you still may want to put those in a newly drafted plan, even though you have portability because of these other considerations that are out there. So again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, I can't give a blanket suggestion that's going to cover everybody. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip the portability regulations. This is uh, pretty complex stuff. I'm going to pass on that uh, today. Uh, there are some provisions for electing out. If you don't want portability of that estate tax unused exclusion amount, and the return is required to be filed, in other words, it is a taxable estate. Now, I can't imagine why anybody would ever do this. You got a taxable spouse, first spouse dies, it is a taxable estate. We have to file the return, but we don't want portability. And the way we get portability is by filing the return. Return, you got to put a statement on there saying that you don't want portability. Now, why would you do that? I can't think of a single reason why you would ever do that. Because you have to file the return anyway, which is the device that you use to get the election. And you want to elect out? No. The IRS has said in their regs, um, if you want to elect out in that situation, you have to make an affirmative statement on the return by an attachment saying, I don't want portability. Here's the big issue. If a 706 is not required to be filed, and that's the vast majority of people that are out there, very few estates actually ever file a 706. Fewer than that actually have a tax liability. We're well under 1% on tax liability, estate tax liability, out of all decedents estates in any given year. It's about six tenths of 1% that owe any federal estate tax. Now the ones that owe it, it's a big deal for them. And it, it does hit uh, disproportionately small businesses and farms and ranches. Okay. But where you don't need to file a 706 because you're beneath the 5.34 million, and you don't have to file, if you don't file, that means that you're not electing portability. So this is the problem for the vast majority of people. You will have to file a 706 in the first spouse's estate. Some people, you know, as much as I talk about this, I still get lawyers that are saying, I can't convince uh, surviving spouses to do this. I know, I know, it's got to be, a, this is the way that Congress set it up. To me, they set it up exactly 180 degrees backwards of what they should have done. What they should have said was, portability is automatic if you don't want it to elect out. What they said was, if you want it, you have to elect it. Why do it that way? I, I don't get that, but that's what they did. Okay, they did it backwards. And so in these small estates that aren't filing, there's going to be people that miss this. Don't miss this. When I'm talking to lawyers, I tell them this is a huge malpractice trap that's out there. If you're not talking to your clients about this, the vast majority of them are not going to have to file, you're not going to have to file a 706 on their behalf. But if you don't, you don't get portability. And you've got a potential malpractice issue if that becomes a big issue when the surviving spouse dies, which you don't know until the surviving spouse dies. So file the 706. Convince the client somehow. Explain to them why this is important. But the nerve-wracking thing is to file a 706 and put the required information on it that IRS needs for the portability laws. You've got to, you've got to show uh, assets and, and basis numbers and all of that. It does require work, and the lawyer's going to have billable hours to do this. 
to file a 706 for an estate for which there's no tax. And that drives clients up a wall. And I understand that. But that's the problem of the way Congress wrote it. That's why I say they did it backwards. Why do it that way? But again, keep in mind, the people that are writing these rules don't prepare estate tax returns. They don't prepare income tax returns. They have no idea how this actually gets implemented. I, th I think a good rule uh, for anybody that wants to write tax laws is you got to prepare your own returns for at least five years before you write the rules, okay? And then we'll see how they do. Yeah, I, it'd be totally different. But they, they don't do it, so they, they get it backwards just like they did here. At least in my mind, it's backwards. Okay, Okay. I'll skip through that. Oh, um, the non-resident, non-citizen uh, non surviving spouse issue. I don't know if this is an issue, but portability does not apply. They, you have to be a resident citizen surviving spouse for portability to apply. Sometimes we see that come up, uh, but they're not eligible for the carryover. Okay, but because of all these changes and the ramp up in the exclusion level and the portability of the exclusion, a lot of people will say, well, oh, wow, I don't have to do any estate planning. Mm, yeah, there are still reasons to do estate planning, particularly if you've got a business that's involved, that's a separate issue. And you've got to do business planning along with the estate planning. Uh, there are other non-tax reasons to see an estate planner asset protection through entities and trusts and prenups and postnups. That's a big issue for farming operations, for continuity, succession planning. Protecting assets from creditors. What about divorce? I'm going to go through some scenarios later today of creditors, divorce. What can you do to protect assets, business assets, from being blown apart because of those types of events? So what can we do through structuring the business to avoid those problems? Planning for long-term health care. Don't forget about that one. That's part of the discussion later today, too. I'll show you some stats with respect to long-term health care um, and the cost of it and what you can do to avoid having the cost of that eat up the business assets. That's a big issue that's out there for a number of people. Powers of attorney, you still, this is part of a state and business planning. Designating someone else to make decisions on your behalf if you're not able to, or in some instances you just don't want to, for business purposes or for healthcare purposes. It's pretty important. So financial powers and healthcare powers. Watch your beneficiary designations. When I get into that document, uh, common estate planning mistakes, we're gonna talk about this uh, in greater length. Watch your beneficiary designations on uh, life insurance in particular, contingent beneficiary designations. I just did this for myself two weeks ago, actually a week and a half ago. Um, have the insurance agent sat down with the insurance agent he's going through all the policies and looking at beneficiaries contingent beneficiaries you know I'm actually listening to myself here as my wife would say for once um, and I had had one of them that was not right so I caught that and corrected that you got to watch these beneficiary designations to make sure that you're going to get the funds going where you need them to go Okay, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Make sure they coordinate with the estate plan in terms of who's going to get what. Uh, you, you know, life insurance, for example, that's a good way to get funds in the hands of off-farm heirs where we're getting business assets into the hands of on-farm heirs through the estate plan. Okay, that's just one, one way to think about it. And then business succession, that's still another reason to see an estate planner even though the vast majority of people are not going to have any estate tax. There's still all these other considerations that are out there that you have to deal with. Generation skipping transfer tax. Uh, make a brief mention of this here and then talk um, just to set up the discussion of one case a number of years ago in the 1990s that came out of Kansas, not too far from here, uh, a little north of here, maybe a little bit west. Um, south of Larned, oh, shoot, I can't remember the county now. Um, what's, uh, where's Kinsley? What county's Kinsley? Edwards, Edwards that's right. Yeah, thank you. It's Edwards County. Um, the generation skipping transfer tax. This is one that um, is not talked about too much, 
But it's important because if you've got a large estate and you're trying to move property to grandchildren, directly to grandchildren, bypassing the kids, you're skipping a generation, there is a tax. It's called a generation skipping transfer tax. And it's a 40% tax. Uh, the exemption for this one is the same as for state and gifts, so 5.34 million. You know, the thought process by some people would be, well, if I, leave, if I leave property to my kids at my death, and then at their death, they leave it to their kids, well, maybe there's some I can just leave directly to grandkids, and so the government takes a whack at my death, they take a whack at my kid's death. Well, I'll just leave some directly to my kids so there's only one cut instead of two. No, Congress is not that stupid. They've, they're stupid, but they're not that stupid. They figured that one out, and so they enacted a, a generation skipping transfer tax. If you skip a generation, they're going to take a piece. Okay. Um, so that's an issue that's out there, and that was made permanent, the, the allocation of the exemption and the inclusion ratio, in other words, how we compute the tax was made permanent. Now, let me uh, explain this Esther Tubbs case out of uh, the Kinsley area uh, a number of years ago. It's been almost 20 years ago. You've got a, a multi-million dollar estate well beyond the exemption level at that time. It would not be at this time, but it was at that time. What this law says is that the uh, property that constitutes the skips, so if, we're leaving, if I'm leaving property directly to grandkids and that's my property that is subject to generation skipping tax, so the parties that get the property that constitute the skips bear the tax. So the grandkids have to pay that tax. They, they pay that tax unless the dispositive instrument, which is the will or the trust that, that makes the transfer, specifically says it goes, it, it's paid out of other property. But you've got to make a specific reference in the will or the trust. Okay. What happened was you had uh, over $3 million worth of skips made under the terms of her will to grandkids. And there was no clear allocation, in, no clear statement in the will that said, pay this out of other property. It had the common language in the will that says, on my death, pay all my, my just debts and taxes. And that's real common. That's just somebody took a boilerplate form, stuck it in. Now you've got a person that's got a whole bunch of skips. You've got to put different language in there if you want to route the tax differently. And for purposes of Esther's estate plan and business plan, it should have been paid out of different property, not the property that was going to this branch of the family. But that's what happened. There wasn't, a, uh, there wasn't a change in the allocation, and so at the time, the tax rate on, G on generation skips was 55%. So you had $3 million worth of skips, tacked at 55%, so over a million and a half additional tax generated, which could have been entirely avoided had the will, by the way, been drafted properly with the inclusion ratios and your allocations and so forth. They could have done this differently. Uh, but there's a million, over a million and a half that's going to come out of the one side of the family. And the battle in the court case was, all right, uh, who pays this? And they're arguing over this language in the will that says, pay all my just debts and taxes out of the residue of my estate, which was not the skip property. And so you've got the skip people saying, well, don't take it out of our hide. Use that clause in the will and take it out of their hide, the other side of the family. And that side of the family saying, well, that's not a specific reference in the will to the generation skipping tax. Take it out of their hide. So now now you got the family fighting with each other. And then you got the attorney that was put on the stand that testified, well, I'd never heard of the generation skipping transfer tax. And drafted the family into a million and a half dollars of tax that they didn't need to pay. Yeah. So I, I just mentioned that to put this in your mind. That thing's lurking out there. You can inadvertently have an estate plan that throws you right into that. Okay? I actually had one of the children off the side of the family that ended up bearing this tax in class at K-State about two years after this case came down. And I had no idea of the family connection because their name's totally different. Never raised a bell with me. And I, and I talked about this case to the undergraduate students. And, you know, teaching undergraduates is a unique experience. I mean, most of them are comatose, I, I think, you know, for the 50-minute session. 
And I've got this one student in the back of the room that all of a sudden I mention this case, and it's like, finally, there, somebody's looking at my book and interested in what I'm talking about. Well, it was one of the grandkids that was disaffected by this. She came up to me and talked to me afterwards. She said, I didn't realize that was in the book. Said, well, actually, you're supposed to read ahead, as my suggestion is. <laughs> You would, have, you would have known that I was coming to this. Uh, but, that, but she told me the backstory behind this, and it was pretty interesting. Okay? So then I suggested to the other students, you know, you may want to look at this. I do talk a lot about a lot of Kansas cases. You might be impacted in here. Um, but, you know, with undergrads, a lot of what I talk, say is... Oh, that was the rest of the story. I, I didn't finish the story. Uh, uh, he never practiced again. Yeah, he retired. He was retirement age, and he just decided, I better quit. And we agreed. Probably a good idea. Probably a good idea. What? I don't know. I assume the carrier did, the insurance carrier, but I don't know. I don't know. The will was not specific enough, so it came out of the side that got the skips. And that's, that's what the statute says. You can override it with language in the will that directs it otherwise. And it should have been. That's what they needed to do in this instance to make it coordinate with the estate plan. It just didn't do it. Didn't have the right language. Okay. Tough case. And that's one from right home. I mean, that's here. Uh, that's a tough one to see. Okay. Now, what was not included in the 2013 bill, um, no attack on valuation discounts. And that's a big deal. Uh, what I mean by this is we like, with respect to farming and ranching operations, to set up entities and work the parents or the grandparents, the, the primary owners, into a minority position before they die. Maybe by gifting stock to the next generation so that we can work the parents into a minority ownership position and then at the time of death argue for a discount from fair market value in the estate. Particularly if we're dealing with values that are up above the exclusion levels. We can get discounts, valuation discounts for what? Minority interest, lack of marketability because it's a privately held company. It's not a publicly traded company. Okay. There were no, that wasn't changed in this bill. There, there have been proposals to do that, but that wasn't changed. So we can still do that. And there were some other things that are in here too. I'm not going to spend time on those. Now, the president did propose in his budget a brand new landscape with respect to estate planning, business planning, and it's not good. Look at this one here. We thought we had permanency with respect to the exemption of five million plus index, and well, the president wants it changed to three and a half million, and take the gift tax exemption down to a million, and increase the rate on both to 45 percent. Now, that's just in a budget proposal. The Senate has not had a budget in over, well, in what five years now. The last budget proposal that the president sent over to the Senate last May got voted down 97 to zero. This is, this is not going anywhere, but just this is what makes the fall elections also important from a planning standpoint. If you get one party control of the White House, the House, and the Senate, this is going to be your new rule starting in 2014. Because then they've got a free pass to give the president what he wants. Now, let me ask you this. And I don't need to see a show of hands, but I want you to think about this. For how many of you is that a game changer if you move the exemption from 5.34 million to 3.5? Okay. That's a, that's a game changer. That'd be 7 million over the spouses instead of 10.68. That's a big deal. And then your rate goes up. You go to 45 instead of 40.